Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I have a short presentation on learning uh, image reconstruction using known operators. And we also do a lot of image analysis. And this whole trend of deep learning kind of uh, is revolutionizing this entire field. You see it everywhere. People are focusing on very interesting tasks. Uh, tasks. Also some very nice work that um, you can do is essentially perceptual problems. Yeah, you can segment livers, you can detect anatomical landmarks and so on, where you have very little knowledge of how it actually is done by the radiologist. So this is an example uh, where we are modeling essentially how a radiologist is looking at a data set and uh, we're trying to train an agent that picks up landmarks. Uh, and this is a kind of perceptual process. So you look at a certain patch of an image of a 3D volume and then we train this agent to follow towards a specific landmark here, it's a location on the hip. And uh, because this is a perceptual process, you don't know how the radiologist is doing this and we train a deep network to somehow get to this landmark. We do this in a multi-scale approach and we can rather reliably detect where this landmark is actually located. Nice thing with approaches like this, they are extremely fast. These are convolutional neural networks that have really fast processing, processing times. With this one, we only look at a fraction of the data, so we can do something like 200 landmarks within two seconds for a full body CT scan. So this is quite amazing that you can all these perceptual things very quickly, fast and robustly. But uh, one major problem that you have with that is, of course, there's not many guarantees that what the network is actually learning is what you want it to learn. Here we have some uh, assurance because it somehow follows the anatomy and it makes sense. And then you can also argue, well, if the hip bone is not present in the volume, then we can at least see with this agent-based approach that we somehow uh, try to leave the volume. Yeah? So we are kind of getting some interpretation of what's happening here. So this is a huge problem with all these deep learning things is that you have very little guarantees of what the network is going to do and what is going to happen. And what we've just seen in Marcus's presentation uh, is that also a lot of uh, things are going on right now in image reconstruction and I also have one of these two-step methods here where people then essentially take some intermediate reconstruction, this is a limited angle tomography, only 120 degrees of measurement, and then you just take some deep network in order to complete the image. And uh, what I show here is a rather popular architecture in deep learning uh, that is how does this work? Oh, it doesn't matter. You see in the center of the figure, and this is a UNet that essentially does a multi-scale uh, analysis of the image. So it's essentially looking in different resolutions at the image, trying to uh, do, you could say, something like a multi-level dictionary match. And then in the end, it interpolates something that best matches, matches your input data and the expected outcome. So if you do this, you should, I guess you have seen similar uh, approaches like this one. Uh, very well before. So what happens is that you get actually a very good completion. So it kind of works and you get good image reconstructions from it. So we've been kind of intrigued by this and said, okay, this just looks too good. This is an unseen patient. This is, uh, by the way, data uh, from the Lodos CT challenge where we experimented with. And then we said, okay, let's be mean. Let's hide some lesion in there. Yeah? So let's, let's put some lesion in and we put the lesion exactly here into the chest wall and this is also one of the areas of the image where we have very few measurements yeah, because we're running um, into limited angle here so I'm showing a blow-up view of the lesion in the bottom right um, I hope you can see that uh, and just as a reminder what we then show to this deep network actually looks like this yeah? so this is what comes into the network you can see the lesion is there yeah, but it's faint and uh, somehow there's also some shadow beside the lesion where you could say, okay, maybe this is another lesion, so we don't know. And what do you think? Who, who thinks the lesion will be present? And who believes, so who thinks the lesion is present? Who, who believes in deep learning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I have a hard time here. <laughs> Bad audio. Uh, okay, but I can show you something. Uh, the lesion is actually there. Uh, because it was in the input data and the, the algorithm has never seen this lesion and we still are able to reconstruct it. Well, it's just a single lesion, yeah? You could, uh, it's just some random text, yeah? So let's, uh, let's do something else that the network doesn't expect and now I'm doing something really evil. 
I'm just adding a little bit of Poisson noise to the projection data before the reconstruction. And the network, we just did uh, clean reconstructions. The network has never seen this. And this is what happens. It's not just that the lesion is gone, and Poisson noise is probably something you would expect in your data, right? Uh, we have the chest mole moving by approximately one centimeter. And um, yeah, it's a very interesting result. Uh, you could say, good, uh, this is kind of unfair, so let's train the network also with uh, Poisson noise in the input data, and then you can see you re really recover, but you don't get as good as a reconstruction as you had previously, and it's, uh, it's a blurred lesion. Uh, while these are all interesting experiments, we did a couple of more experiments in some occasions, because there's no guarantee. We also had reconstruction results like this, and now I'm using a very sharp window towards the air behind the patient, and what you can see is that uh, where you just essentially have streaks in the input data, because the network is doing um, a multi-resolution analysis, uh, it's tr starting to paint uh, kind of organ-like shapes floating around uh, our reconstructed volume. And this is also then the point when we said, okay, so this is uh, produces sometimes really fancy images, but things like this shouldn't happen. So we want to embed some guarantees in there that we do not suffer from these problems. And then the question is, uh, do we really have to reinvent the wheel every time we train such a network, or can we embed somehow knowledge about our reconstruction problem into the network? By the way, something people in machine learning um, is are very much fighting about this, because uh, there's quite a few people out there that say, oh no, everything has to come out of the data, and the data knows everything, and you cannot fiddle with prior knowledge, and so on. And then there's other people that say, okay, you have to mix this with models because otherwise you can get uh, probably terrible results and there's no guarantees in it. So um, I'm looking back now to some theorem, universal approximation theorem, uh, that is uh, some fundamental theorem for guys in machine learning because it essentially tells you that you can approximate any kind of function uh, on a compact set um, if you, so I'm using for the approximation now capital U and the true function is small caps U. And if you just use a linear combination that are weighted with some UIs and essentially inside is just an inner product of the input uh, and this S function here is a sigmoid function which is uh, a nonlinearity that is you could use for thresholding for example. So if you have a structure like this one, uh, this is by the way uh, a so-called hidden layer or a fully connected layer then uh, this universal approximation theorem tells you that this error is bound by some value epsilon u, and the epsilon u will uh, diminish or can be reduced the more neurons, the more nodes you actually apply in the hidden layer. Essentially speaking, if we know this, then if we had an infinite number of neurons in the hidden layer, uh, we could approximate any function with very high accuracy. So at some point you essentially end up uh, in memorizing your entire training database and then just uh, interpolating them. But uh, this is an interesting uh, may a way of looking at the data. And by the way, this hidden layer, uh, if you just look at the uh, two <coughs> linear in combinations in there, if you skip, or if you don't have the nonlinearity in there, it would simply be able to model a matrix multiplication. So in every of those deep fully connected layers, uh, you could have one matrix multiplication in every la layer. And then you have some additional thresholding on top that includes the nonlinearity. So if we go ahead and uh, think about that, what I'm really interested in is, is kind of mixing the power of what we get from the deep learning with things that we already know about the learning problem. So I'm calling this uh, known operator learning because, for example, the geometry of your reconstruction uh, is, is known, you calibrated it, so you would be interested in embedding this here. Or, for example, if you do MR reconstruction, there is going to be a Fourier transform in there somewhere, so you can place it uh, also as a fixed block into your module. So uh, this is kind of complicated, starting with a deep net uh, right away. So I'm first looking here into the special case where I'm uh, essentially assuming that this function can be separated into two blocks of functions. Uh, so there's some function G and some function U. U is a vector-to-vector -vector transform. G is just a vector-to-scalar. And this is uh, a decomposition of F, and this is our actual model. So I postulate that there is a modularity in the function that we want to approximate, and uh, that it actually exists, that there is somewhere a known operator on the way. So if we do so, then we can think about the approximation. So we can approximate, of course, um, in the first line you see here, we approximate U. 
and then introduce some error EU. Or you could approximate D and no U, then you get some error EG. Or you approximate both of them, then you get some error EF. And now the real question is, uh, can we somehow put those errors into relation? Can we get some insights of how they relate to each other? So, well, I can plug them into my previous definition. So I know if I start approximating G, then I have to add back essentially, you know, I have to check whether I really can't do the pointer. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No, it's not the middle one. Well, you see in the first sign that there is this uh, G that is now replaced with the approximation coupled with G. And uh, if you do that, you have to add back the error, of course. And then you can also see that I can replace U by the component uh, of U and uh, use the definition of G, that is this linear combination of the nonlinear function, nested. And then in the last line, you see if I now approximate U as well, uh, I'm getting this error that is caused by U in there, but it's inside the nonlinearity. Yeah? It's inside uh, of S. And so it's difficult to, uh, to actually figure that out or to pull it out because we don't know what the nonlinearity is doing to our error. So what we can do now is uh, we can't pull it out, but we can look at bounds. And uh, I'm just using um, essentially a, a Lipschitz approach uh, for approximating these bounds. And the nice thing with the sigmoid function is it has a Lipschitz bound. So there is some maximum slope and, and I can just linear uh, extrapolate in order to get an upper or lower bound. And I'm just using this idea and I'm now skipping over the derivation because what you get in the end is that there's an upper bound of EF and this upper bound is essentially composed of some error that is introduced by U amplified by the structure of G plus the error in G. So what we see here is if we know either G or U, the respective part vanishes. Yeah? And this tells us that if we know one of the two functions, of course, our maximum bound shrinks. And this is interesting. It's well in line with classical pattern recognition theory. Uh, so we know that in pattern recognition, they have been looking into getting good features, doing all this manual feature extraction and handcrafted features. Because if you do an error in your feature extraction, then of course it cannot be recovered by your classifier. So this is all well in, noun, in, in line what we know from machine learning theory. Um, and now we would be interested in extending this to deep networks. And this can also be done. You then can also prove this, that there's this upper bound. You, you just need a recursion. And then you can show that uh, the specific bound here, uh, as here shown in equation 13, emerges. And so we were quite happy that uh, this was just public, uh, published in Nature Machine Intelligence um, this August. And it, now that we can really show that if we embed this knowledge into our operations, then we can also put this into some applied context. And here we're looking into a filtered back projection reconstruction. Everybody of you, of course, knows that this is a convolution and then the back projection. And you may want to suppress negative values. And of course, this uh, can be interpreted as a uh, kind of feed forward solution where you have uh, the transpose of your, your reconstruct uh, of your projection operator and then some inverse that we uh, know because of the Radon inversion that is this con kind of convolution that is a filtering. Now, uh, we've seen that uh, matrix multiplications and circular matrices in order to express convolution is also something that you can do very efficiently in neural networks, which means that you can map this entire reconstruction network, uh, this entire reconstruction program into a network. And it's not even a, a very deep network because here it only has three layers. You have a, a convolution layer, a back projection layer, and some non-negativity constraints. And what's this, uh, in particular interesting is we don't need to train this at all because since Radon, we know uh, how to initialize those weights here. Uh, so there's need, no need for learning. And now we can look at this and uh, maybe look at the family reconstruction formula. Then it's slightly more complex because we have to introduce the cosine weights and Parker weights that are just pointwise multiplications. And we can still formulate this as neural networks. And uh, again, we don't need to train unless you have a configuration where you don't have a proper, uh, proper inversion formula. So I'm looking again at limited angle reconstruction. So here's a full view reconstruction. Um, and this one is what we get of the limited angle. So it's only 180 degrees. And this is 20 degree uh, fan angle. So we're missing approximately 20 degrees um, for short scan. And now we can look at this and uh, 
train our network and what you see is that you can essentially compensate very well for the emerging artifacts. There's still, s still some streaks, you may not be seeing them in this window, but we get a quite improved uh, reconstruction formula here. And now the interesting part is our reconstruction formula is not just a deep net, but we can map it back into our original interpretation and have a look at the weights. And here we see that in particular the um, Parker weights have been adjusted. And um, interestingly, with the on the right-hand side, you find the new weights that are generated by the training process. And uh, in 2017, there was actually a very nice publication uh, from Dirk Schäfer where he's proposing uh, redundancy weights to compensate for missing mass in the projection. And uh, it turns out that our network is learning something very similar. What you can also see is that towards the beginning and the end of the detector, we don't, uh, we don't go as high as the uh, weights proposed by Schäfer. And this is simply because we never had objects in the training data set that would span the entire detector. So we would never get a gradient there and back project it. But essentially, uh, our retraining of this algorithm found uh, a very interesting uh, modification of the Parker weights that would allow us to compensate um, for the missing mass. So what else can be done? Of course, this is only filtered back projection. You can also uh, employ this in iterative context. We've already seen that we want to have some data consistency in there. You can go in approaches like uh, Marcus is doing this. Here I'm showing some joint work with um, Tom Pock and Kerstin Hamanik. So they uh, did these variational networks in MR reconstruction. You can do something similar also for CT. Here we start with our learned reconstruction like altered FTP reconstruction and then we want to enforce some regularization such that we get optimal image quality. And uh, then what we effectively do is we write up uh, some energy minimization problem, compute the uh, gradient of the entire energy minimization and then you can essentially do a, a stacked network where you would repeat the same process over and over again. So we start with our neural network reconstruction and then we put in these kind of regularizing blocks and the only unknown part here is the kind of sparsifying transform that we, that we need to find. And now we essentially use the training process in order to figure out the sparsifying transform that is optimal with respect to our image quality. And uh, also this is quite nice. Now I'm showing uh, finally some more um, focused window more on the uh, more on the soft tissue parts and you can see that our neural network reconstruction still had problems from streaks they were oriented as you would expect in a limited angle reconstruction and on the bottom right you can see that these streaks can very efficiently be suppressed with appropriate regularization and it's not just denoising because you can see on the bottom uh, left this is just uh, DM3D denoising that would uh, preserve those streaks and with approaches like variational networks uh, you can really find um, regularizers that help with this kind of reconstruction. So my time is uh, coming to an end, so I'm also going to end this presentation now um, with just one more idea that uh, will also be shown then tomorrow by Christopher Süben. Uh, and there we were thinking about using this also in a mathematical relation that we derive neural networks. And here we were, here we were interested into rebinning an MR acquisition such that it uh, is represented in fan or cone beam uh, uh, projection. So imagine you have a hybrid scanner. Then you would like to create overlays for on uh, like uh, X-ray and MR, but you have to sample the MR data in a way that it matches the cone beam projection. And what you can see here is that we only, this is the training process visualized, now one for projection independent and projection dependent but we are only training with geometric primitives and noise. We are just using cylinders and noise in the training data. And on the right hand side, you see the application onto an anthropomorphic phantom. And what you can see is that our rebinning formulation improves over the iteration. And in particular, it is able to preserve the, the anthropomorphic details because we have this very strong regularization because we feed the entire geometry as a prior knowledge into the system and effectively are only um, learning some filter functions and are able to uh, approximate this quite well. Okay, so what's the gist of all of this? Uh, I think known operator learning is uh, an interesting approach because it allows you to combine all of your classical reconstruction work and to be honest, a lot of this is already done out there. So many people are embedding operators into networks so we're not the only ones doing this. And uh, this is really nice because now we can blend 
the advantages that we get from deep learning with all the classical theory that we have. And if we design the network in the right way, it is still a classical reconstruction method and we can interpret the parts uh, still with our classical method. And this is really nice uh, because it gives you security, it will help you generating medical products and so on, because you can <coughs> decompose things into parts and analyze the uh, individual modules of the training. So I think this is an interesting idea to go. Many people are doing this. Of course, we're not doing this alone. Many people, groups around the world who have, uh, we are working together and that are following very similar directions. And uh, with this, I want to end my presentation and thank you for your attention. <laughs>